Welcome to the lesson 36 of industrial instrumentation. This lesson is a continuation of the uh, lesson 35 where we have discussed the chromatography 1. In this lesson, we will discuss chromatography 2. So, let us look at the contents. This is a chromatography 2 as I told you. The contents are gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, chromatogram. Okay, so, we will see that in this particular lesson, so we will discuss uh, the actual the how the chromatogram should look like and uh, what are the if the multiple peaks comes and what are the problems, what exactly I mean the the shape of the chromatogram should be. I mean that depends actual the uh, finding the uh, concentrations of the different components of the gas and liquids precisely. At the end of the lesson or end of the chapter, the viewer will know different equipments and different operation techniques used in gas and liquid chromatography, different detectors used in the chromatography and their purpose and their classification. We will find there are different types of detectors available. There are thermal conductivity detector, there are flame ionization detector, there are electron capture detector. Ca capture detector. So, there are different, I mean the principles are, uh, I mean somewhat different in though the thermal conductivity detectors are the oldest one and most widely used detectors in the gas chromatography, but we will discuss the uh, other detectors also where you will find that we will making a derivatives of the particular uh, particular um, uh, particular element of the mixture, so, so that to find the concentration accurately. How do operating conditions like pH value temperature affect the chromatogram? Okay, so, we will find these things also the pH value though I mean it is I mean um, not very important in the case of gas chromatography, this is very important in the case of liquid chromatography. Gas chromatography already that, that we have discussed, gas chromatography makes use of a pressurized gas cylinder and a carrier gas such as helium which is inert in nature to carry the solute through the column because we will find we have discussed this thing that there is a column and through column this uh, the gas should flow. right? And, can, and there is a packing material inside the column, so which will adsorb or absorb and elute it after some time one by one. Gas absor adsorption that is gas solid chromatography involves a packed pit comprised of an adsorbent used as a stationary phase. Common adsorbents are zeolites, silica gel and activated alumina. These are the most common sort of I mean adsorbents are used in the chromatography. This method is mainly used for separating mixture of gases. So, you will find this is basically used for the mixture of gases, right. Gas liquid chromatography is a more common type of analytical gas chromatography. In this type of column, an inert porous solid is coated with a viscous liquid which acts as a stationary phase and diatomous diom di Atomaceous earth is the most common solid used and solutes in the feed stream dissolve into the liquid phase and eventually vaporize and the separation is thus based on the relative volatilities. Okay. So, you see you can see that these are all different, this already we have discussed in the lesson 35, now we are discussing in more details. Okay. You see the last line which is most important, the separation is thus based on the relative volatilities. Okay. Now, capillary gas chromatography uses a glass or fused silica capillary walls which are coated with an ad absorbent or other solvent and the column has only limited capacity because of the small amount of stationary phase. However, this method also yields rapid separation of the mixtures, right. Now, chromatographic equipments, what, what we need and the entire chromatographic equipment, let us look at that. Basically, you will see the um, uh, figure in the next diagram, in the next slide. Basically, a gas chromatograph uh, consists of six parts, a supply of carrier gas in a high pressure cylinder, a sample injection system. Number three is the separation column, okay, where we have the packing materials and all those things. The detector which is most important, in this particular lesson we will uh, discuss the detectors in very much details. Okay. There are various kinds of detectors, we will discuss the detectors in very, already we have discussed about the 
uh, the packing materials in the case of I mean, in the case of gas chromatography we will discuss also in some uh, to some extent that thing in this particular lesson and electrometer that means and a separate thermostated compartments for housing the column and detector so as to regulate their temperatures right so detector usually followed by a strip chart recorders or any other electronic recorders where we will I mean uh, record the peak. In the strip chart recorders you will get a hard copy, so it can be computerized also where you will get the actual plot on the screen itself. Now see this is a schematic of a gas chromatograph, we see can we can see here ok this is sample injection systems, we have a column here you see the columns are made like this. Okay, columns are these are the columns. Okay, these are the columns we can see here. These are the columns. Then it is going out, and this entire thing placed in a thermal chamber. You can see these are thermostatic chambers we have used, and there is a bridge. What is the bridge? And, and there is a reference detector. We will find that to make the uh, I mean uh, other things nullified because you see this type of measurements already we have did in the case of Wheatstone Bridge. We will find the same principles is utilized, especially in the case of thermal, I mean thermal conductivity detector, this is used. And we have a measuring detectors and we have a recorder. This is a reference detectors, okay. This has no column, nothing is there, only detector is there, and there is a measuring detector. Because measuring detector, I mean suppose that the detector, if the temperature, I mean if I want to make the temperature independent or ambient temperature variation independent, so in that case I should use a reference detector. The reference detector has no column, nothing but it has the same I mean uh, same material same I mean what are the inside the components so that uh, the temperature variation everything will be nullified and I will get the only the only the this will go to the two opposite arms of the piston beach so that it will be nullified. You will see this thing in the uh, next I mean in, in subsequent slides. Now sample injection systems let us look at the sample must be introduced as a vapor in the smallest possible volume. Sample should be very very small, so small is the I mean small is the amount that is better for our detection. The peak will be better that is most important thing right. So the sample should be because ultimately we are measuring the relative concentrations ok, so it does not matter I mean if it is small or large. So if it is small so it is good for us ok, the detection will be easy, the peak will be more separable, we will see the, that type of things. The sample must be introduced as a vapor in the smallest possible volume and in a minimum of time without decomposition. It should not be decomposed that is most important thing. Liquid samples it is order of 1 to 10 microliters in a volume are usually injected by a micro syringe through the self sealing silicon rubber septum ok. So it is a very small amount that we can see 1 to 10 microliters and it should be it should have a micro syringe so that a very small amount can be injected. The most accurate and precise method for the gas sample used uh, a calibrated sample loop of 0 0.5 10 milliliters and a multiport rotary valve. So different different types of rotary valves will be used in the case of uh, in the case of this type of sample injections, okay? Because sometimes we need a valve so that the precise amount can be injected. The smaller the sample, the better the peak shape that I told you. Okay, the peak shape should be uh, better and better. How the peak should look like? Let us look at that. You see, the peak should be the ideal peak should be. Suppose I have a, suppose I have two components. So time it is in one, two, three, four. So it is coming like this, the two peak is coming like this, right. It is a good separation, separation of the two components, the two peaks are coming like this. It might be sharp also, it may not necessarily it will be like this one, it can be I mean sharp also, it can be like this one, it can be very sharp like this one also okay now if the, this is always possible if the sample quantity is very very small if the sample quantity is large you can see that the what type of what type of peak you will get you will may get a peak which looks like this
actually do it actually looks like this one. So, it is very difficult to find the area under the car from this graph. So, this is another way that why we I mean give so much emphasis on the small quantity of the sample right. The smaller the sample the better the peak shape. When a very dilute solutions are to be analyzed the use of a concentration periculum such as 2, 6 diphenyl uh, p phenylene oxide porous polymers allows the quantitative transfer of up to 20 microliter of sample. Okay. So, this is a precise transfer of the uh, particular amount of liquids we are considering here. Now, derivative formations. Derivative play an important role in gas chromatography for analysis of polar compounds such as fatty acids, steroids, drugs, biological amine and phenols etcetera. Derivatives make a polar compound less polar improve quanti quantitations and increase the volatility of high molecular weight compounds. Chromatographic columns, so let us look at the columns first. There are basically two types of columns, the packed bed column, open tubular or capillary column that is already we have discussed in the lesson 35. The packed columns are made of stainless steel, copper or glass tubing of diameter 1.6 to 9 millimeter and typically is 3 meter in length. Okay. We have seen that it is a zigzag fashion because it is a large column length 3 meter of length you can see you cannot accommodate. So, it should be zigzag phase. Capillary columns have an open unrestricted path for the carrier gas within the column. And it is a long narrow tubing of length 50 to 150 meters extremely long and of diameter 0 0.25 millimeter extremely small and its inner wall is coated with the liquid stationary phase to about 1 micron thickness. Right? Column constructed of silent treated pyrex glass have the most desirable features. A good packed bed column will have a nominally 1000 to 3000 plates per meter or we have seen that this concept actually came from the distillation columns. So, more number of plates better is the separation. Capillary columns range from 1000 to 4000 plates per meter, this is a theoretical value right. The sample capacity of capillary column is determined principally by the thickness of the stationary phase on the column walls. The coating usually done is of silicon gum. Packed columns are usually formed into several coils and placed within the open compartments. Okay. It is a several coils we have seen, okay. it is coil looks like this that we already we have seen, it looks like this, right, looks like this. It can be coil like this one also, but it is better I mean if you have, so it will get, it will come and it will go out like this one. So, the packing materials are inside this column. So, the packed columns are usually formed into several coils and placed within the open compartment. Open compartment is nothing but a temperature I mean uh, is a thermostat based or more precisely controlled temperature environments. Capillary columns have tubing coiled into an open spiral and basket coil or a flat pancake shape. supports. The purpose of the support is to provide an inert surface onto which the stationary liquid phase can be placed in a pan, in a packed column. The diatomaceous earth supports may be either fire brick derived materials like chromosome P and anachrome ABS etcetera, these special materials. The acid washed grade will perform quite well for the analysis of relatively non-polar samples liquid phase. The stationary liquid phase provides the separation of the column. In addition to selectivity, the liquid phase should be chemically or thermally stable that is most important thing. Now, ovens as I told you, the oven is used for maintaining the precise temperature control around the column. Okay. Hence, the column movement should be free from the influence of changing the ambient temperature and should have a well designed and adequate air flow system. There should be good air flow systems, otherwise temperature control will be difficult. Detectors. Now, detectors we will discuss in very much details as I told you. The detector senses the presence of 
the individual components as they leave the column as they leave the column so we will have the so all the detectors we have injection systems we have a carrier gas okay we have a solvent pump everything is there so it will go to the column from the columns it will come out it will elute depending on the adsorbent material absorbent material and ultimately it is come to the detector. So, all the columns will be followed by a detector and detector will be followed by an another recorder. The detector output after amplification is stressed on a recorder as I told you right. The different types of detectors generally used are thermal conductivity detectors, flame ionization detectors, thermionic emission detector, flame photometric detector, electron capture detector and helium detector. So, we will discuss some of the things ok. So, we will uh, discuss some not all we will discuss in this case. So, that anybody can refer to some st standard book on the gas chromatography for this. Detectors in chromatography are generally operated in two different ways. They respond either to the concentration of the solute or the mass flow rate. Those responding to the concentration yield a signal which is proportional to the solute concentration which traverses the detector. An elution peak will result when the signal is plotted against time right. So, there can be different components. So, how does it look? Let us look at you see here that the selectivity efficiency this is very important in the case of the peak right. So, those are the things we should discuss what is the selectivity, what is the efficiency let us look at. I have you see here. These are injections I have made here. This is adequate selectivity. But poor efficiency. see here good efficiency and selectivity this is the desired characteristics and selectivity. Okay. And you see this is a another one where you can see like this one this is a good efficiency but poor selectivity. Okay. So, selectivity efficiency I mean everything we have discussed for the two columns in this particular slide right. So, these are the desired characteristics for any I mean the peak should be look like this one. So, who will decide this one actually this will be decided in the detector itself efficiency of the detector selectivity of the detector. So, the two most important thing for the detector is the selectivity and efficiency and the also the partition ratio right. So, an elution peak that I just drawn elution peak the peak is the what we have drawn is called the elution peak right. So, this is the peak which we have drawn talked about. So, this is the suppose. So, this peak is called the elution peak because it will come out of the gas and suddenly it will detect at the output. For such detectors the area under the peak is proportional to the mass of a component and the inversely proportional to the flow rate of the mobile phase. Hence, an important care of keeping the flow of the mobile phase constant for such a detector is necessary. If differential detectors that responds to the mass flow rate, the peak area is directly proportional to the total mass and there is no dependency on flow rate of the mobile phase. You see, let us go back first of all.
Now, you see when I talked about the uh, thermal conductivity detector, thermal conductivity detector is the one of the oldest detector and it still is used because of its simplicity of the system. It is very simple system and it is very widely used, data are available over the years people are using these things and it is non-destructive, okay, that is most important thing for the mini of the gas chromatography, right. So, let us look at the how it looks. I have a block looks like this. Okay, let me take a new page. Block is there, and Okay, here actually I will put the detector. So, here it will look like this, then it will go like this. Okay. So, this is our lock. So, this is the gas flow in. And this is the gas flow out. Okay. and this is the block. It will work as a heat sink, please note, work as a heat sink because there is a some sort of heating here and this actually if I want to make uh, the it is independence of the detector, okay, independence of the other parameters of the detector because detector output should be should be solely depends on the uh, I mean different components of the or the elution peak. So, in that type of cases the it should not influence with any other I mean any other components any other components of the other detector itself. So, that is the reason we are using two detectors. So, let us look at how the two, two detectors uh, methods are using. It looks like this we have a one detector here then we have a here. 100 ohm this is 100 ohm bridge balance so there is an ammeter 0 to 500 milliampere this is coming through a resistance 100 ohm it is coming here. So, this is excitation voltage E x, this is excitation. So, this is coming to the recorder because this is the unbalanced voltage. Okay. So, this is the detector 1. And this is the detector 2. Okay. So, same carry gas is passing through both the detector. Okay. So, in both the cavity that means cavity means actually we have showing that we can have a four same sensors also. Okay. So, it looks like this you see this is the thing let me, let me first explain then I will go to that. See two detectors are there. So, same carrier gas is passing through the both the detectors, but there is no column or anything on the detector two. Initially what we will do I will balance with the by varying this potentiometer I will balance the bridge. So, whenever the detector I mean I mean the elution peak comes after when the gas is coming out I mean have elution peaks. So, detector output will change because the, there is a thermal uh, conductivity there. So, it will change. So, automatically if it changes I will get an unbalanced voltage that will be recorded in the recorder right. Now, again you see the in the hydrogen flame ionization detectors for high sensitivity analysis of organic compounds the hydrogen flame ionization detector is used that is different thing. Okay, we will discuss that thing also. So, two detectors are using you see we can have four detectors also four detectors in one block itself right it looks like this you see. So, what they have we have one four detectors is a block. 
I can have two detectors and I can have four detectors also. It is coming like this one, right? Okay, let us go back. Now you see this is the flame ionization detectors. As I told you, this flame ionization detector is one of the detectors. So the different components in the flame ionization detectors. This is the exit end of the column. Let us look at. You see here a jet capillary is there. Okay, it is I mean flown through this one. This is the hydrogen air flame, and air is coming through this one. And this is with the with the air and hydrogen. So it is I mean, so we have a collector assembly nut. We have insulators and we have a collector hole. We are putting across the uh, high voltage inside the detector plates. So what is this? Let us explain. The flame ionization detectors is currently is one of the most popular detectors because of its high sensitivity, wide range, and great reliability. As shown in the figures, I mean this particular figure, figure 2, I think, uh, figure 2, the column affluent enters the burner base through the multipore filter. So, through this one it is enters and is mixed with the hydrogen gas and mixture burns at the tip. This is the tip of the hydrogen, you see this is the tip, let me, uh, okay. So, this is the tip, you can see here, this is our tip, hydrogen tip. The jet air with the air or oxygen because through air it is coming, so it is going down and is burning. Ions and the free electrons are formed in the flame, and these enter the gap between the two electrodes. We have two electrodes, and the, there is a high voltage and the flame jet and the collector, which may be a parallel plate or might be cylindrical. Okay. Now this is mounted around 0.5 to 1 centimeter, 1 uh, 1 centimeter above the flame tip. So, above the around 0 0.5 either to 0 0.5 to 1 centimeter, half centimeter to 1 centimeter above the flame tip and across the two electrodes a high voltage of 400 volt is applied, right. And this lowers the resistance across the gap and it causes a current to flow, right. Normally an external bucking voltage is produced to balance the potential generated by the ions and free electrons generated in the pure hydrogen air flame. This ensures that a net current flows only when ionized materials enters the gap. When the net current flows when the ionized materials enters the gap. Thus enhancing the differential sensitivity of the detector, the current flow across the external resistor is sensed with the voltage drop and is amplified and displayed on a decoder. Now hydrocarbon groups are introduced into the flame and a complex process takes place in which positively charged carbon species and electrons are formed. Now the current is greatly increased. Okay. Now this flame ionization detector responds only to the substance that produce charged ions when burned in a hydrogen air flame. So that is most important thing. In an organic compound the response is proportional to the number of oxidizable carbon atoms. So this is basic principles of the flame ionization detector. Now, if I look at the thermoionic emission detector, you see this is thermoionic emission detector. It is principally something different. It employs a fuel poor hydrogen plasma. This low temperature source suppresses the normal flame ionization response of a compounds not containing hydrogen and phosphorus. Although the response to carbon is not entirely eliminated, a non volatile uh, rubidium silicate bead here, you see here non-volatile medium silicon bead centered about 1.2 centimeter above the plasma jet is electrically heated by variable current supply to between 600 to 800 degree centigrade. This arrangement permits the fine adjustments of the bead's temperature and independent of the plasma as a source of thermal energy. With a very small hydrogen flow, the detector responds to both nitrogen and phosphorus compounds enlarging the plasma, the changing the polarity between the plasma tip and the collector and detector responds only to the phosphorus compounds. Okay, so that I can make it nitrogen, I can make it sensitive to the phosphorus compounds also. Now compared to the, uh, compared with the flame ionization detector, the thermal emission detector, thermal ionic emission detector is about 50 times more sensitive for nitrogen 
okay and about 500 times more sensitive for phosphorus okay so any traces of phosphorus any traces of nitrogen can be better detected in the case of i mean uh, thermionic emission detector compared to the flame ionization detectors though flame ionization detectors also is a relatively new compared to the thermal conductivity detector the minimum detectable limit is around 0 0.06 pg i mean per second for nitrogen okay so this is the thing you can see here that there is a flame tip which is one point around 1.27 above the plasma jet okay so this is our i mean thermionic emission detector last we'll discuss the electron capture detector you see this is the electron capture detector now electron capture detector has two electrodes within the with the column effluent passing between one of the electrodes is treated with radio isotopes that emits high energy electrons as it decays and these emitted electrons produce I mean amounts of large amount of low energy thermal uh, secondary electrons in the gas chromatography carrier gas all of which are collected by other positively polarized electrode either of the positive polarized electrode molecules that have an affinity for thermal electrons captured electrons as they pass between the electrodes and reduce the steady state current thus providing an electrical reproduction of the gas chromatography peak of the two general designs the plane parallel and the concentric cell and the latter design is preferred since it is easier to construct a small low dead volume cell in this form now particular radioactive sources which are used that the tritium adsorbed in the titanium or scandium and nickel 63 as a foil or plated on the interior of the cathode chamber. Tritium sources have a high specific activity giving a large standing current and a high sensitivity but the beta energy is so low that the source is extremely susceptible to contamination. The maximum working temperature is 225 degree centigrade. Now nickel 63 is a higher energy sources that can be used up to 400 degree centigrade. Okay. So this is, you see this is the I mean we are I mean, talking about the electron capture detectors. I don't know go back. Now adsorbent in cases of gas solid chromatography. Inorganic molecular sieves are naturally occurring for synthetic or synthetic zeolites which are comprised of interconnected cavities or pores of uniform size. Four types of molecular sieves are varying in pore diameters. Okay, this is absorbent because it is a different type. So, so the dimensions of the pores are so that the I mean it is Armstrong level so that the sum of the larger cannot enter the pore, some will enter which is smaller in diameter. Varying pore diameter and alkali metals contents are available. Type 3A, a potassium uh, alumino silicate with the pore diameters of 3 Armstrong, it will adsorb the molecules such as water and ammonia. Okay. It will adsorb the molecules of water and ammonia. Type 4A, it is a sodium analog type of 3A. Okay. It will adsorb the molecules of carbon dioxide, right? sulfur dioxide, hydrogen, disulfide, disulfide ethane, ethylene, propylene and ethanol right type 5a with calcium replacing part of the sodium content of content of type 4a and it will separate most of the hydrocarbons okay in many i mean i mean this particular industry this is very important type 13x a sodium aluminosilicate of different crystalline structure from the preceding types has a pore diameter of 10 armstrong the molecular sieves separate molecules not only according to the size and configuration but according to the polarity and degree of unsaturation as well. Columns prepared from carbon molecule sieve type B with pore radius of 5 to 15 Armstrongs are also available. Porous polymer packings are analogous to the porous gels used in the exclusion chromatography those made from the copolymers of aromatic hydrocarbons provide column packings of low to moderate polarity. Polymers made from the acrylic esters and provide the packing of moderate to high polarity. 
solid absorbents like silica gel, aluminia, etc., are used for specific applications, right? So these are the some specific applications we will use: silica gels, aluminia, etc. Right? It is also these are also basically adsorbent. Please note. Large retention of silica gel for carbon dioxide, which eludes after an ethane, is useful in multi-column systems. Okay, because there is large retention, which is it will retain it for a longer time, so it will obviously help to get a better peak. So the large retention of the silica gel for carbon dioxide, which eludes after ethane, is useful in the multi-column system. Similarly, alumina is useful for retention of unsaturated hydrocarbons because unsaturated hydrocarbons. So, it will obviously helpful for retention because you have to retain, right? So, that is the thing of the packing materials. Multi column systems gas solid chromatography is more complicated than the gas liquid chromatography since all gas mixtures contain components which are not separated on or will not pass to a particular column in reasonable time. Back flushing substantially reduces the analysis time. In series cross detector, across detector, one column is used before the detector and a different column is used after the detector. The same packing may reside in both the columns. Okay. In two column series bypass techniques, a column switching valve, valve enables a column to, to bypass by the carrier gas and at the selected time so that the certain components can be stored temporarily there why the separations are made on column 1. Liquid chromatography, let us know only 15 percent of the known compounds lend themselves to the available analysis by gas chromatography owing to the insufficient volatility of thermal stability. This is the most important, the gas should not vaporize every time we have said, right. The liquid column chromatography does not leave the limit, this limitation. The interchange or combination of the solvents can provide special selectivity effect effects that are absent when the mobile phase is a gas. Traditional liquid chromatography was achieved by gravity since analysis took place at a slow rate. In modern liquid chromatography known as the high performance liquid chromatography, a pressure is applied to the column forcing the mobile phase to the through at a much higher rate and the pressure is applied using a pumping system. So, okay. Instead of gravity, I am using a pumping system. You see, this is a typical liquid column chromatography, the entire instrumentations we are showing here. Okay, we have a reflux systems we can see here. I am sorry. Okay, you see here. So, we have a pressure gauge here, we have filter, heated solvent dissolver, pump and this is a pre -oculum. and this is an analytical column. So, which is injection head here, syringe and there is a detector and this is coming to the detector. So, this is the entire instrumentation system. So, this thing should be put in a thermostatic bath so that the constant temperature can be achieved, right. The general instrumentation for liquid, liquid chromatography incorporates a solvent reservoir for the mobile phase, a solvent pump, a pre -oculum, except for the bonded phases a pressure gauge, a sampling or injection device to introduce the sample into the column, the separation column and a detector. Solvent delivery system, the solvent delivery system should have the following features, precise delivery of solvent over a relatively broad flow range, maximum pressure attainable, compatibility with other components in the high performance liquid chromatography system. Compatibility with the wide choice of the solvents and low noise levels in the detector resulting from any pulsations. Removal of the dissolved air and other gases is also necessary. Okay. So, there are three main types of delivery pumps used for solvent delivery system namely reciprocating pumps, syringe type pumps, then constant pressure pumps. Final choice of pump is made after the considering whether the isolation of the gradient elution is to be performed and the minimum detectability limit desired type of separation column. The detector employed precision in quantitation and the cost of the package chromatograph. Sample introduction, the ideal sample introduction method should be able to insert reproducibly and conveniently a wide range of sample volumes into the pressurized column as a sharp plug with little loss of efficiency. Two kinds of sample introduction methods are mainly used. One is a syringe injection, 
In the syringe septum injection, a small 10 microliters already we discussed, the smaller the amount better is the peak. Sample is introduced into the pressurized column with a high pressure syringe through a self sealing elastomer septum and directly on the top of the column packing. Okay. So, it is to be given on the top of the column packings. We have seen that thing. If you look at the figures, you will find you see syringe. So, it is at the top of the column packings we are giving here. You see here, top of the column packing we are giving. Sample introduction. Right. Now, sampling valves and loops. Sampling valves allows the sample to be introduced reproducibly into a pressurized column without significant interruption of flow. Separation column. Heavy wall glass or stainless steel tubing which can withstand a high pressures are generally used to construct liquid chromatography columns. Columns with an internal diameter of 5 millimeter provide a good balance between the sample capacity, the amount of packing used, the solvent required and column efficiency. 2.1 millimeter bore packed column requires about 5 times the inlet pressure or as the same length of 4.6 millimeter bore column for the same flow rate. Replacing the steel columns, excuse me, steel columns with comparable cartridges permits the cartridges, permits the dedication of the cartridge to each application thus maximizing the life. Column packing that lie in the range of 3 to 7 micrometer in diameter are used for exclusion chromatography. Column temperature is maintained by circulating air baths or by using water jackets or, or thermo, um, thermostat that is already we have discussed. Oven is nothing but a thermostat where it is a te constant temperature is maintained. Okay. Or you can we can make it, I mean instead of oven, where you can circulate with the jackets where the constant temperature and you can by controlling the circulating waters, we can control the temperatures of the oven also um, of the column. Preceding the separation, column should be short 5 centimeter protection column to absorb or filter unwanted materials. We can see there in the if you go back to the initial slide, you will find on the instrumentation systems we have a filter. Okay. So, this will be I mean filter all the unabsorbed unwanted materials. Detectors. Choice of detectors mainly depends on the problem at hand. The different types of detectors used we have photometry detectors, flowmetry detectors, infrared detectors, differential diffractometers. Types of high performance liquid chromatography methods. Adsorption chromatography. Adsorption chromatography is probably one of the oldest types of chromatography around. It utilizes a mobile liquid phase that is adsorbed onto the surface of a stationary solid phase. Equilibrium between the mobile and the stationary phase accounts for the separation of the different solutes. In this method, the components are separated on the basis of their polarities. Physical selectivity is dominant in adsorption chromatography. Adsorption chromatography is used when the sample is completely soluble in organic solvents and the molecular weight is less than 2000 for all the sample components. We have for more than 2000, we have some different methods. Liquid liquid partition chromatography. This form of chromatography is passed on the thin film formed on the surface of a solid support by a liquid stationary phase. Clear? Solute equilibrates between the mobile phase and the stationary liquid. LLC is best used to separate homologs where the separation is based on the molecular weight selectivity. Right? A successful separation is achieved by establishing the proper balance between the attraction of the mobile phase solvent and the stationary liquid phase for the sample. Good separation can be achieved by matching the polarity of the sample and the stationary phase and using a solvent which has a different polarity. Ion exchange chromatography. Here in this type of chromatography, the resin, the stationary solid phase is used to covalently at attached anions or cations on it. Right? 
solute ions having opposite charge in the mobile liquid phase are attracted to the resin by electrostatic forces. Right? This method is used for compounds with the ionic and ionizable functional groups. If the sample is the insoluble in organic solvents, but soluble in water giving a solution that is not neutral or is only soluble in dilute acids or alkali, then ion exchange chromatography is used. Molecular exclusion chromatography, this is also known as, known as exclusion chromatography, sometimes it is a simple exclusion chromatography, but actually it is a molecular exclusion chromatography. Let us look at. It is also known as a gel uh, permeation or gel filtration chromatography. This type of chromatography lacks an attractive interaction between the stationary phase and the solute. Sometimes there is this desirable properties. It is generally used when the molecular weight approximately exceeds 2000. In case where it is less than 2000, we have adsorbent method. Here we have a Okay, molecular exclusion photograph, I mean gas chromatography, which is used for the molecular when the molecular weight is more than approximately exceeds 2000. This method is based on the pores property of the substrate to sort and separate sample mixtures according to size. The pores are normally small and exclude the larger solute molecules, but allow smaller molecules to enter the gel, causing them to flow through the larger volume. This causes the larger molecules to pass through the column at a faster rate than the smaller ones, right. So the pores are normally small and exclude the larger solute molecules, but allow smaller molecules to enter gel, causing them to flow through the larger volume. This causes the larger molecules to pass through the column at a faster rate than the smaller ones. The chromatograph output or which is called the chromatogram, so let us look at, consider the output from the detector that is chromatogram as shown in figure 6. You see this is a typical uh, chromatograph which we got at the detectors or the strip chart recorders or the different components. We have a gas, we have a components of A, B, C, D. Okay. This will be, I am sorry. So, this will be A, B, C, this will be D, different components and this will be E. Right. So, this is the chromatogram for the uh, another one. So, is adsorptions, absorptions, this is also you see here. See the sample is separated in the column, different peaks on the chromatograph corresponds to different components in the mixture. Clear? See the sample is separated in the column itself. So, when it is at either absorption, it eludes and come to the detector. So, it is one by one is detected. Different peaks on the chromatogram corresponds to different components in the mixture. This I told you several times. The chromatograms were obtained by separating a protein mixture using ion exchange chromatography. Okay, depends on the what type of, so in ion exchange chromatography you can use a protein, we can separate a protein mixture. The separation corresponds to the chromatogram and was performed at a lower pH value than 1 in P. If you look at you see the, the pH value is uh, was performed in a lower value in A than B. You see A has a lower pH value than B. You see the obviously the separation is better in the A. So, this will tell you that is actually the how the pH will, uh, will affect the actually my chromatogram. So, pH should be maintained so, okay, to a particular value. So, it should be neither low or neither high like that. Okay, this about these chromatograms we are talking about. Since the samples is separate in the column, different peaks on the chromatogram corresponds to different components in the mixture. The chromatograms were obtained by separating a protein mixture using a ion exchange chromatography. The separation corresponding to the chromatogram that is the A was performed at a lower pH value than in B. This actually should look like this, pH would, should not write like this, it should be like this. It should look like this, right. This shows that the cooperating conditions such as pH and temperature affect the output of the chromatography. Okay. If the pH changes, so your chromatograph will change. So, obviously, they, if the chromatogram change, efficiency, selectivity, everything will change. So, this used to be 
So, precise what are the desired value of the um, chromatogram that is to be maintained, right. Fourfold information is obtained from the chromatogram. What are the different, I mean, components I am getting from the chromatogram? What are the different, I mean, informations I am getting from this chromatogram? Right? Already we have discussed, but let us jot down, right, what one by one. The level of complexity of the sample is indicated by the number of peaks. How many, what is the complex mixtures? I mean, that we can detect from this one. So, level of complexity of the sample is indicated by the number of peaks which appear. Qualitative information about the sample of composition is obtained by comparing peak positions with those of the standards. Okay. Qualitative information about the sample composition is obtained by comparing the peak positions with those of standards. Quantitative information regarding the relative concentrations, this is most important. So, we are measuring relative because the sample if the we are not absolute measuring, we are making the relative comparison, relative concentrations actually we are measuring in the gas chromatography, okay, because otherwise we cannot measure it because we need the injections and the, and the it is only 10 microliter that is the best, the smaller the sample better is the detection, sorry. Quantitative information regarding the relative concentration can be obtained from the peak and area comparison. Column performance can be checked by comparing with the standard outputs. Okay, this column performance also, because uh, if I have, if I know, if I know the particular, suppose if I want to calibrate the column performance, I know the particular gas which, which actually we are injecting. Okay, so, so that, that, that time when unknown gas is coming, if I want to calibrate the, how the column actually working. So, the column efficiency can also be known, I mean, can be, can be known by looking at the chromatograph. So, these are the four, I mean, features, I mean, which we will get from the gas chromatography. The most important thing is the relative, I mean, first of all, the what are the different components of the gas present in the mixture. Second thing, the relative, uh, this is the most primordial importance. Second thing is the relative concentrations of the gas or liquid or whatever it may be in the mixture, okay. So, with this, I come to the end of the lesson 36 of industrial instrumentation. Welcome to the lesson 37 of industrial instrumentations. In this lesson, we will uh, study the pollution measurements. Uh, when we are talking of the pollution, basically we are talking of the environmental pollution, or so the air pollution, or so the type of gases that means uh, the carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen oxide, all these type of gases, how it is making the air polluted and uh, we must measure it because you know the certain, I mean if it crosses some limit that is and it is not safe, it is hazardous for the human being. Pollution will be there, you cannot in industrial, industrializations, you know there will be pollutions, you cannot avoid pollutions, you have to live with pollutions, but what is the level we must know because uh, if you, st I mean stay in some uh, forest or there is obviously the pollution will be less, but if you live in a city obviously there will be some pollution because of the uh, exhaust of the car and truck and all these things, the uh, burning of the fuels, burning of the waste, because you, do you know the waste is a big problem in a, I mean uh, cities or metropolis, you, they cannot dump it and they usually they burn it because that will reduce the volume of the waste. So, that will cause the pollutions, the factories, the power stations, all these things will make the air polluted. Now, we must know what is the concentrations of the different gases and if it is within the safe limit, fine. Otherwise, you have to check it and you have to warn our um, goal is to warn the public or, or the, uh, so that they will also know that uh, what type of pollution they are going through and what is the, uh, what should be the safe level of content. Now, in some countries, you will find that the forest fire that also will cause the pollutions, okay. Some countries where there is a, uh, I mean where it, uh, I mean like Australia when it is very dry weather, when nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide in the sample reacts with the ozone which is produced by passing externally supplied O2 over UV lamp, part of the NO is oxidized to become a nitrogen dioxide, right. Part of NO2 generated in this is in the excited state. Excited states so actually we are uh, defining it by this one, please note.
this phenomena is called the uh, chemi luminescence actually you see here. So, we are defining this NO2 uh, this asterisk means it is in excited state I am sorry it is in excited state NO2 asterisk if it is excited state plus O2. So, it is NO2 excited state it is I mean liberating the actually this will be H nu I am sorry. this will be H nu NO2 second equations if you see NO2 asterisk which goes to NO2 plus H nu right. You can this will be uh, if I this will be H nu right. So, the light will be emitted. So, above mentioned reaction is very fast and only NO is involved without almost any effect of the other coexistent gases. So, this also you should remember because it should not react with other uh, gases. So, the other concentration of the gas cannot be detected by that type of uh, method. So, the phenomena is called the chemiluminescence. So, by this so it is the nitrogen oxides reacts with ozone, it is making nitrogen dioxides which is in excited state, it will go back to the normal nitrogen dioxide. Now, you see we have then, now this is a color code of representations of AQI, we have given the color code representations ok. That is uh, anybody can understand that the green means always friendly as you know the environment green environments we are talking about always is a good environment. So, we have given a color of green. So, 0 to 5 I mean AQI value. So, it is green color it is good 51 to 100 marginal moderates we have yellow yellow well I mean I cannot justify it why it is yellow uh, it is uh, some standard is to be followed. Obviously, the green means that is our environment is green always is better for us. Then we have to 101 to 200 unhealthy poor I mean orange. Then we have a 201 to 300 uh, AQI value very unhealthy very poor which is one say red alert red means always alert and 301 plus is a critical I mean there is no more for consumptions of the I mean for that year is consumption for the human being or any living uh, animals. So, these are the things which we have considered in this uh, I what we mean to by AQI. So, because if you give the color because it is very difficult to remember all these numbers. So, instead of giving the numbers we will measure this one, but uh, once we define when to the public. So, we will give with some color. So, that uh, green is bad, better yellow is ok fine, orange is not that good, red is quite bad and if the purple it is extremely bad right. So, with this AQI color codings we can explain to the general public. So, what that what the color what the color they should they should have in their particular area of uh, residence or particular area where they are working. So, with this I come to the end uh, the lesson 37 of industrial instrumentation.